On today's show, it's the first of a big two-parter. We've got Martin Rickman with us. We're going to look at some big Cavs post all break questions on a new Locked On Cavs. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com backslash Locked On today to get started. All right. First of a two-parter, as mentioned at the top, Evan and I have Martin Rickman, the, the head honcho, the boss man, but not boss man 99 because he doesn't use all caps and he's been active this season from Diamond Up Rocks. Martin, what's going on, buddy? How are you? I have been active. Um, I hope that... <laughs> Jay's active again. It'd be interesting to see what he's going to bring the Milwaukee Bucks. I forgot about that. That's how crazy the last few weeks have been. <laughs> I just forgot that he actually was traded after all of this. So. Yeah. Wow. Sleeping on, on Jay Crowder. All right. So what we're going to do for these two episodes. He has his own. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. So what we're going to do in, this, in these two episodes is six questions, one per segment. I'm going to kind of play the point guard to Evan and Martin and and hop in here or there a little bit and I'll keep the trains running so to speak but first question we're just going to go big one right off the bat we're going to just dive into the to the to the biggest maybe bigger picture question no, no small talk we're just going we're going straight in like we're you're, you're you get the shot with the beer at the bar we're going in buy the ticket are, take the ride that's right are the Cleveland Cavaliers right now contenders here's what i would say and then i will turn it over to evan first i do not think they're in the absolute elite inner tier this still kind of feels like a leveling up year to some degree but if you look at the players and you look at the numbers and you think about it for a little bit you could talk yourself into this it wouldn't shock me if they made some noise but they wouldn't be like my first pick evan are the cleveland cavaliers contenders right now so in the macro sense, no, I wouldn't say they are. But like you said, if you focus in on like the micro levels of it and start to break down the numbers and just look at the personnel of this team and like the fact that they have the propensity to play big and big moments, like, yeah, you could make a fairly compelling argument, especially just depending on how the Eastern Conference shakes out. Like we're recording this right when the Atlanta Hawks announced that they uh, parted ways with Nate McMillan. So like that opens things up a little bit more in the East. Uh, we don't know what Brooklyn's going to do. They just extended Jacques Vaughn, but they a bevy of forwards and they could kind of just take a step back in terms of the Eastern Conference race. There's obviously going to be Philly and then you have Boston and Milwaukee ahead of you. So like it's going to be a four cat race. We'll see how Kevin Love looks in Miami, of course, too. He's talking crap to Bam Adebayo on Instagram about making space for him to make shots. So obviously we'll see how that goes, but it depends on who Cleveland draws maybe in the first and second round. Yeah, they could break into the Eastern Conference finals, but like that hurdle to get from there to the NBA finals is, is quite a bit, especially for a team that didn't make the playoffs last year. And I know like you had Donovan Mitchell and you technically had Danny Green and his overabundance of experience and like th- th- there's steps in the right direction, but you want to crawl before you walk and you want to crawl before you ball in this sense to quote um, a once great rapper who shall rename nameless, but yeah, I, I I could be sold on it. It depends on who they draw in the East, obviously, but it's going to be hard to get past Boston, who has the taste of the NBA Finals. It's going to be hard to get past Milwaukee, who I still feel like should be a favorite to win the championship this year just because they have Giannis Adenokounmpo on their roster and like a bunch of defensive specialists that just rock. And it's going to be interesting to see how it goes. But like, yeah, right now they're just kind of in a weird limbo phase. They're like in adolescence kind of where they're kind of growing into that adulthood phase. So uh, you're playing with house money at this point. If you're the Cavs still like you're you're in a new area that you haven't been before and you're just trying to figure out where you fit. And yeah, it's an evaluation. But it's like you said, if you start to look at like the micro sense of things, it gets a little. A little crazy and you could convince yourself on it a little bit. Yeah, I guess it just depends on what we're defining as contenders. If contenders is a shot at the Eastern Conference Finals, then yeah, I do. Uh, uh, let, let's say let's let's raise the bar. Let's go tight. Let's go title contention. Let, let's look at title contention. I think that's an unfair place to place them in. So I'm gonna say no. I think like, I just don't. That was never the goal for this season. If it was, you would have seen a more active trade deadline. 
if, if Kobe Altman expected there to them to be contenders, you wouldn't have just ended up with a buyout Danny Green. Like, I'm sorry, they had Kevin Love's expiring contract sitting there. They've got a lot of money they could have used, whether it's Karis LeVert, Jetty Osman, to add with that. They could have made any number of moves if they were really pushing all their chips in. They chose not to. So to me, that says they're happy with what they have, but what they have is a top four seed in the Eastern Conference. And honestly, Mm -hmm. it could be a top four seed or top six seed overall in the NBA, which is pretty good. I I think pretty good is an exciting place to be if you're Cleveland. Um, But I feel like we've been having this argument, whether it's Cavs fans, whether it's podcasts, whether it's the national media, whether it's sports talk radio about where the Cavs sit for the entire season, they go eight and two. Oh, are they contenders? Are they a top three? They win four out of 10. We're back down to, well, are they the six seed? I think all along we've said this when they got Donovan Mitchell, they were going to be hopefully a top four seed in the Eastern conference. They are Mm -hmm. going to be a top four seed in the Eastern conference. The job is being done. They're growing together. And I think we'll probably get into this later, but a lot of what's going to happen moving forward is going to be contingent upon the continued growth of the players in place. That being said, if you just assume that what you have is good enough, you could potentially run into some problems. And I'm not just Mm -hmm. saying that in terms of the league, where you look at teams like the Memphis Grizzlies, who maybe liked what they had and are fine in the West, but maybe aren't fine, depending on how things go this offseason or whether or not they're bounced early in the Western Conference. Um, if you look at even in Cleveland across the town, you've got the, the Guardians who were fine with what they were, but maybe that was going to be the best shot that they had. They didn't make any major moves at the deadline. They had a pretty good team, but they got bounced. And the margin for error in the MLB is really not that big. They might look back on that, have one or two injuries this season, think that their guys are going to continue to progress. They don't. Someone else doesn't make a leap. And all of a sudden you're at 500 again. That's what I worry about with Cleveland and what I've worried about from the jump. When you go get a guy like Donovan Mitchell, you have to you have to put yourself in as good a position as possible to win a title with Donovan Mitchell. And look, I mean, even the Golden State Warriors did not think that they had enough. They went and got Kevin Durant. They continue to retool. They went and got Andrew Wiggins. Like the reason their window has been as large as it is, is in large part because they're continuing to tweak their roster and they're Good enough isn't just good enough for the Golden State Warriors. Mm. And I'm not, again, comparing these two franchises because that's putting unfair expectations on the Cavs too. But you have to also make things easier on your young stars. And some of that is continuing to recalibrate, using the contracts that you have in place and continuing to add talent in any way you can. I think it was a missed opportunity, not trading love for somebody else who had another year on their deal, no matter who that player was. That player could Mm -hmm. play zero seconds for the Cavs, but you have to continue to move things on down the line. Then ending up buying him out anyway, that's the thing that kind of hurts me. But if you use that extra roster spot and you go get Will Barden or a guy like that, I mean, it's fine. But again, we're just talking about, you know, trading sheep for for, um, iron or whatever and and settlers of Catan. Like, unless you've got a master plan in place, and maybe Kobe does, I think you're talking about this team making a run to potentially the second round and anything beyond that, like Evan said, is house money. But that kind of hurts when you've got a player that good who can score 40 mm. in an all-star game. The first time Eddie Cleveland Cavalier has ever scored 40 in an all-star game. Like, I think that's where everyone needs to stop and take a second and say, okay, this player is a top 15 player in the NBA, might be a top 10 player in the NBA healthy. You've got to go do everything you can to win with that guy. And that doesn't just mean make your young players happy. I, I just, I, I, I think that's where they have to really make some tough calls over the summer but that's, you know, you go ahead and make a run like the Hawks did. <laughs> I just don't think you can be complacent. I don't. No. I think you've got to try to get better no matter what happens this, this playoff run. Because the Hawks kind of pushed everything in because they thought they had a team that was better than it was. I think the Cavs have a team that can be better than they are. So you might mm-hmm. as well go surround it with all the talent. I think the Cavs stars match up with anybody else. And in terms of youth, that's the other thing that they have going for them. But I, I just don't think that good enough is good enough. You've got to go be great. I, I absolutely agree. I think I think this puts them in a place where I think like they will probably be either the th- like I, I think Boston and Milwaukee are probably going to be the two best teams in the conference. Yeah, we will see how on that. F- we'll see where how three four ends up. That that's it's part of a question later as far as seating between Philly and for Cleveland, uh, that in itself is is a little bit tricky to kind of to na- maybe navigate some of that. 
I think it doesn't feel like this year, but if you told me they like made the conference finals, I also wouldn't be surprised. And I, I think that's an interesting place to be. And I wonder what they do with that. I wonder what that means for them in the summer when they are going to try and, and push forward, you know, in, in a certain way and in a in kind of a, a more. Let's just say like in, in a more kind of clean forward way and just like how do they balance if it's not the full two timeline saying how do they balance the youth versus a, you know i need to prove yourself to donovan mitchell to prove yourself to darius garland and, and prove to these guys that you're gonna go where they want to go all right let's go into our first break let's come back we're gonna go to question number two which is is gonna maybe the stakes are a little bit lower on question number two but i i think you will find that question interesting but first we got to tell everyone about a great sponsor for us and that's FanDuel. this episode is brought to you by FanDuel. The midway point of the NBA season is here, and it's the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. New customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's a that's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. All I got to do is download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. You can bet on anything from the money line to point scores and threes drained. You know, right now in the app, they have a great ringer NBA boost. At plus 130, if you all you have to do is to win that bet. Two of the Celt, two of the Celtics, the Bucks, the Suns, the Nuggets, or the Clippers make the NBA Finals. That's not bad value if you like two of those teams to make it to the finals. Those are some of the league's very best teams. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same game parlay. So don't miss your chance to get your no sweat first, but up to one thousand dollars in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com backslash locked on. That's FanDuel.com backslash locked on to learn more. Make every moment worth FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right, second question. Isaac Coro has had a really good stretch of play, a, the best play of his career to date. Martin, we'll go to you first. Is he the biggest swing player for the Cavs the rest of the season? Without a doubt. I mean, they didn't make a move because they thought that Isaac making the leap was real. And Kobe even said that in his media availability, that we feel good about where we are because of Isaac and what he's been able to do. And you remember how young this kid is and the tools that he has. If he really does make the jump, that helps the Cavs immeasurably because he's the player that they thought that he was going to be when he was starting at small forward, heading into the summer. And you thought, okay, well, he's working with our robot. All this stuff is going to be good. He doesn't have to do a ton to stay on the floor. I think of anything, they've been a little bit too cautious with him and they have cut the training wheels on too much. And maybe that's part of the master plan. You know, like last year they talked about Mobley, you know, easing in and they didn't want to put too many expectations and too much pressure on him with Garland. They also have done the same thing. So it's possible that that's part of it, but like Isaac should be playing 30 plus minutes a game. Like I, I I'm sorry, the way that this roster is shaken out and this is no disrespect to any of my Penn state guys, but I don't think you should see Lamar Stevens playing another minute for the Cavs the rest of this season until unless someone gets hurt or unless there's a blowout in any one direction. I think that rotation gives you the opportunity now where Isaac should be on the floor without a doubt. He's proven that he should be. He gives you much more than just shooting when he isn't shooting. And if he is hitting 40 plus percent of his threes and slashing the way that he has and has been showing the confidence he has of driving when he has the ball. His vision is pretty decent. He's collecting rebounds. He's great at getting steals. Like he takes on the toughest challenger every game. He does things that you need for a winning basketball team. And he does that even if he doesn't have counting stats. And I think that's huge on a team where usage rate is always going to be a concern. I mean, heading into the beginning of this year, the conversation was, will there be enough shots for Evan Mobley adding Donovan Mitchell? We figured that out. That's great. That's been good. Like, I'm, I'm glad that they figured that thing out. But there doesn't have to be shots for ice. There can be. If he's scoring, if he's hitting, keep him going. But if he isn't, chances are you're getting 30 minutes of pretty solid basketball out of the guy. And look, like, let anybody else think that they want what they want about him if they look at his numbers. But I believe that if you look at on-off and you look at starters numbers and you look at the lineup data – Ice is going to be in the top of any one of those combinations and configurations. So it's just time to play him more. Like I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but he's mm -hmm. not averaging 30 minutes a game. He needs to be averaging 30 minutes a game. Like that's, that's the first thing. And I think his confidence level is, is the biggest marker for me. He looks like he gets it. It looks like the switch has been flipped. It's just not one of those like switch being flipped from starter to all-star things. So it's a little bit harder to notice unless you're watching every cast. 
So I have a quick question for you, actually, Martin. Do you think it's really indicative of them being a little too cautious with Isaac Okoro and you see Karis LeVert just kind of like dwarfing him in minutes? Like, this is no disrespect to LeVert and like he's functional as a sixth man for this team. But I think there's just like a correlation of like LeVert playing a lot more than Okoro and also just kind of being in that defensive liability. Like, do you think that's just an indication to you that JB and the coaching staff are maybe just putting Okoro in a box at times still? I, I think it's possible. I mean, it's it's worth asking JB if they're maybe getting him to be honest about this, about if they were trying to just ease him in and didn't want him to have too much pressure on him, especially with how poor his first 10 games were. If you remove that that 10 game sample, the guy's been really good this year. He has. Mm. But the problem was that those 10 games were so bad that everybody was jumping all over him. And that probably led to a little bit of a snowball effect and him putting more pressure on himself. But once that was released. And I think maybe that's partly of keeping him in the box to start with. But now I think you've got to unleash this guy. And I don't know if it's just Karras. I mean, you look at what happens. There were a lot of games where like Lamar was playing in the fourth quarter or he was getting like 18 minutes. All the the other starters would come back in. The Philly game when JB went to Lamar was one of the weirdest coaching decisions that he's made in a long time. And like that was a clear like go back to a core moment and he went to Lamar who's a worse shooter. And I was just like, I I don't quite get this. And it, it you could feel like Okorum, like you have to let Okorum play through that stuff. I think, I, think is where so. I, I think those are learning moments for a young team. And they've been playing that game between getting better and gaining experience and learning in tough, teachable moments, but also competing. And I think the job that JB has is a really difficult one. And I think that like scrutiny that he's gotten for that kind of diminishes the, the impact that he's had in being able to bridge those two things, which is not an easy thing to do. Look at what Steve Kerr had to do with the Warriors. Look at what Memphis has had to do. Look what Denver's had to do. Like when you want to try to get your players better, you also need to win basketball games. And, you know, I don't know that he knows necessarily which combinations are the best ones for him. And so he's testing mm-hmm. things out. But I think at this point in time, we know we have enough data this these last 23, 25 games, whatever amount it is, you've got to play your best guys and you've got to play your best rotations. And we have enough data to show what those are. And those don't involve Lamar and they don't necessarily yeah. involve Jetty. Like you are going to shorten your bench to eight or nine guys now and you've got to figure this out and you've got to play them. It's not to say you can't bring a guy in, try something else out, try to get a spark if they're not working. But outside of that, I just don't think you need Lamar right now. Don't get me wrong. Like he's useful to this basketball team for a variety of reasons. One of which is there will always be an injury. There will always be a guy hurt or they need to go super small. I think the biggest issue the Cavs have right now is that they just don't have a reliable backup big. That's the thing that's really hurting them. I don't really care so much about Karis LeVert playing a bunch of minutes. I don't care that like they're going to test Jetty out. I don't care that Danny Green might come in and play a few minutes. Like those are all fine things and they're great to have. But the fact that Kevin Love wasn't playable for a large portion of this season to a level where he was then bought out. And Miami's so desperate to have a guy like him that they are now like acting like he's playable. I, I wish him the best and I hope things go well for him, but we all saw it. He could not play on the defensive end of the floor. And that's even if he was hitting shots in a certain game, he was a liability for that basketball team and he was hurting everyone around him. And it was hurting him personally. Like you could tell it was bothering him and they couldn't move laterally. So I just think that's the thing. If there was a missed opportunity, it was not going to get a power forward or a center or a stretch big or something like that. And like, they're just going to need Dean Wade to step up. I mean, that's probably what it is. I think you need Dean and Okoro to just step into the roles that they are supposed to be in and trust that they're going to succeed in that role. I, I I agree with what you said, and that's I'm glad we kind of just opened up on that a little bit and expounded upon things. Just because Kevin Love is gone now, like there is an opportunity for more minutes for Isaac. There's more opportunity for more minutes for Dean, but Dean has faded as of late. But like like you said, Okoro is consistently solid on both ends of the floor, and like he's a very low usage. And to your question, Chris, yeah, like he could be a huge swing player for the Cavs, I think. I have like just come playoff time, maybe more questions of just how like teams defend like Darius Garland and Donovan Mitchell and how do the Cavs adapt to that as well? Just because you've seen times of like the Bucks putting the Cavs in hell last season where Drew Holiday just matches Darius Garland minute for minute and you watch the offense completely sputter and like do you watch a team like kind of zero in on one of those two and ask the other one to shoulder it? Like Donovan, yeah, I think he's comfortable with that, but is Darius comfortable doing that in a playoff scenario? So you need Isaac Coro maybe just to be that swing guy who is the connective tissue between offense and defense. I, I've said that for a while now, just what his viability is as a player for this Cavs team. 
And also just how do teams defend him come postseason time? Like you see this in the regular season, a lot like teams will sag off of him and he makes them pay for it. Like he shoots threes with confidence and there's other times where he bricks it or teams are uh, justified in sagging off him because there's just times you see the youth and inexperience come out and they ignore Isaac just sitting on the perimeter like that. So I think he has the capability to be that guy. I think there's going to be the runway to give him more minutes now that Kevin Love is for sure gone. And then like you're trying to tighten up the back end of your rotation a little bit, like as to Martin's points, like your your bench guys are going to be Rubio, Levert, and Wade come playoff time, I'd assume right now. So with a little bit of green. Yeah. That's with a little it. bit of green and maybe like it, it depending on if you add a guy um in the bio market now that you have this open roster spot too like the calculus could change a little bit but they, these are small minutes like yeah that's fine this is supporting stuff but i think you need to just keep investing in confidence in isaac okoro and to martin's point like kobe altman made that clear like hey we need to give isaac okoro the benefit of the doubt and like let him have this full season in this situation to see what we have with him and to kind of circle back to the first question I obviously Isaac Ohoro playing with confidence and being a swing player isn't going to make or break the Cavs being a contender this year, but it does or at least how he performs in the playoff mate playoffs this year, kind of like open up a couple more questions of, is he going to be a viable option come postseason time? Or is he the guy we need to have an uncomfortable conversation about using as a trade chip? Because there is intrigue there, but can we make a clear upgrade on the position with him? Because maybe we just don't think we can play past some of the liabilities he presents. Yeah, and I think the big thing to do with him is allowing him that freedom to be creative because he is one of the best players on the Cavs in terms of turning up the tempo. And when the Cavs are moving more quickly, they typically are more successful despite the fact that they're one of the slowest teams in the NBA in the half court. So it, he gives them that, that, um, that engine that they need to get out and run, which is also what Ricky provides um, as a change of pace guy. And I just think that's the other thing is like, make sure you're getting these ice in these lineups more frequently where they can run in the positions that they were letting Jetty do that. I just don't think that Jetty is the guy long-term and that's okay. I'm like, look, he's going to have his 30 point game. He's going to have one in the playoffs. Everyone's going to say, why isn't Jetty playing more? But Mm -hmm. ice needs to be the guy that is taking over that role as a hybrid where he's with the starters. He's able to lock down his guy and he takes the shot. Even if he doesn't make it, he takes it without hesitation because it's the right shot for what needs to do things um, from a spacing concern. But I just think he also needs to get involved in some of these other secondary lineups too. And that's where JB needs to make sure he's looking at that data and and, and finding out those, those rotations. And it's not an easy job to ask of him, um, but it is something that I think is really critical to their success for the playoffs. And that's something as we've seen with the Cavs in the past, Playoff rotations have not always been their strong suit, no matter who's coaching <laughs> the Cleveland Cavaliers. Um, mm-hmm. There was always the Jeff Green rotations that were not great, and they were the worst on-off minutes with the Ty Luda years. And so you just need to – you've got to trust the best players on the floor. Having a guy like Donovan makes it easier. Having yeah. a great starting rotation where your fifth starter is a guy you don't need to worry about also helps. But that guy needs to be capable of scoring 20 points randomly because that's just how the playoffs are. you you mm-hmm. got to have a guy that can do that for you. And that's what Macau Bridges did. And I'm not saying that that Curl is going to be Macau Bridges, but the more he can be, the better that position that puts you in, whether you're utilizing him for a finals run or you're using him to go get a player like Kevin Durant later. Like, that's the thing. Like, the Suns were so comfortable with what Macau became, he got them Kevin Durant. Like, let's not forget that. So if Isaac's able to get you a player, a premier player, to then get you to the title, that means he did his job and that means that he was the right draft pick. He's 22 just turned 22 like he's, he still has so much potential and that that's the thing that's tantalizing for me and probably is tantalizing for a lot of gms around the league who are probably kicking themselves that they weren't banging down the door trying to get him when he was struggling because P- Cavs fans wanted to give him away oh yeah ago. you know they said he was the worst player in the nba like he was never that bad but we we are focused on results over process all the time and we tend to forget that Guys sometimes need to figure out who they are in the NBA, and it takes a few years. It took Andrew Wiggins a few years, and he was the number one pick. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that's just something I don't want people to lose sight of here. He is the best chance this franchise has right now to have the 3 and D wing that they kind of need. And what he does in the play, that they, they, like you win championships in part because you have a lot of those in this current NBA. And if he hits in the playoffs, that will be a big deal. And I, you know, maybe they extend him in the summer. And I didn't think that was possible, but I, I'm curious to see like what his future looks like. He is such a big swing piece for them in terms of their upside. All right, one more, Rick. We're going to come back. We'll hit quickly on Darius Garland right after this. 
All right. Guys, this is going to feel weird to throw a Darius Garland question out there. But is it wrong that I think he could be 5% more selfish, take a few pull-up threes here or there, and just add a little bit to this game? I understand that so much of the value of him, why he's so good, why he is key to the team is that he empowers everyone around him, that he pl- when he's at his best, he is so like tied into the flow of a game. But particularly in the playoffs, when you're going to need to find buckets just from your best players, how you can. And maybe there's a night where Mitchell's a little bit off or Cora's not making his threes or whatever. I kind of think Darius maybe just needs to go to work a little bit more. And I just want to see him turn that dial up at the and pick his spot and do all that stuff. And take some pull-up threes and jack a couple more up and just look for a shot of a little bit more. Is that is that unfair? I don't think so i think we've talked about this a lot he's sometimes unselfish to a fault and we you ask him post game like he had a career high game and they lost to the timberwolves as like their first home loss of the season he said he could care less care less about that he would rather have won the game like i think that's the type type right type of disposition you want from your franchise point guard but yeah he can be a little unselfish to a fault sometimes like he's asked our our too many turn- turnovers of bad things like no for being aggressive in terms of playmaking and creating offense like i don't think so but there are some opportunities you're like, man, I just wish he had a little bit of that selfish ed- selfish edge and would rip it sometimes. But I don't know. It's just it's an awkward balancing act because we talked about like JV is an untenable position. So these players of like figuring out how to win now, also all developing and becoming comfortable and also getting Donovan Mitchell feeling as comfortable as possible with this team. And I think the duo of Mitchell and Garland just being so comfortable with one another um, certainly makes things a lot easier for everything else. But I don't know. I think Garland is more than okay with um, having pretty much the same numbers as last year and much better efficiency, all while not having to shoulder a lot of the offensive load because Donovan Mitchell, to Martin's point, as he said several times now, has the capability to go off for 40 points and 10 assists. Like I know the all-star game is the most recent example, but like he's very, very cool and comfortable doing that. And Garland, I think is more than okay with that, but yeah, just me selfishly as a basketball observer, just wishes he had a little bit more of that selfish streak in him sometimes. Martin. Yeah. I think that's the big thing too, is just knowing when is the time for him to turn it on. Um, when the Cavs get really behind, He has absolutely no problem doing that. And then you see him score in bunches and go absolutely bananas. But it shouldn't take that for him to feel like he can if he's in the flow of the game. That being said, I trust Darius implicitly at knowing the temperature of the game. He is such a good feel for what is needed in a way that you don't see very often from a lead guard. It's it's like Steve Nash, Chris Paul style, where he sees what he needs to do for the team to win. And he exerts the exact amount of energy that's required in that. And I think he knows that based on his body type, based on the bumps he takes, based on sometimes not getting the calls that he should be getting. He's still feeling that out and working out, but he's a good teammate and he wants the guys around him to succeed and thrive. That being said, there should never be a game where Karras has more shots than Darius does. And I think that needs to be a focal point. Like there should be, Two players, maybe, who have as many shots as Darius does every night. And that's Donovan Mitchell and potentially Evan Mobley. Everyone else on the team should be shooting fewer than him, and they should be shooting way fewer three-pointers. Darius should be shooting the most three-pointers on the team, probably. But, but I get that Donovan sometimes goes into volume and takes 12 of them or whatever. But that's that's something that they really need to hone in on, um, is identifying who should be taking the shots and how often. And... You have an all-star point guard who is extremely efficient. And when he has the balls in his hand, the ball in his hands, like typically makes the right decision. I would try to maximize the amount of times when that's happening as, as possible. If you're JB Beckerstaff, Mm -hmm. that's, it's a simple solution for me. And just because he didn't make the all-star game, like let's not get it twisted that he's, he's having a better year than he had last year. Yeah. Playing complimentary with a superstar. And he had his face busted open the first day, day game of the season. Like, the fact that all of that has happened and he's rolled with it and has become more efficient, has become more confident, has become a better basketball player in spite of and like in like lieu of all of these things is pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. And I don't want that to kind of go unnoticed. Like even if we're bickering about the number of shots he's taking, like it's amazing that Darius Garland has improved again. <laughs> 
after an all-star season in which they added a superstar and had the third overall pick be expected to make a jump into an all-star level caliber of play. And that player is also should be first team all defense. Like it's pretty amazing what Darius has been able to do. Most superstar style players like that. Mm -hmm. It's not as seamless. And I I just want to make sure that we're giving Darius the credit that he deserves because just like it has been like all along in his entire career, he's not getting that credit. He's not getting mentioned with the guys that he is peers with and sometimes better than. And I just want to be one of the people who's championing that because if someone else isn't going to say it, I'm going to say it even louder. He is an all-star who didn't make the all-star team. He, I think in, in some ways you can trust him more with the ball laying in a game than you can with Donovan Mitchell. And maybe that is something that we need to talk about too at some point because mm-hmm. Don's been great and Don sh- set shot is actually really good, but he sometimes has a, a tendency to force it with two, three minutes left in the game. And if he doesn't have it, I think we really do need, we need Darius to be initiating the offense more often and Don maybe cutting, slashing, figuring out ways to get him the off ball to get that shot because I, I, I just think Darius typically makes better decisions and that's not, a, a knock against Don. It's just how smart and capable Darius is as being a lead guard. Like that's how he is as a point guard. So I think that's one of those like little things we bicker about. If there was anything that I wish the Cavs did a little bit more of other than play Bakuro more, it's stop giving up, you know, 10, 20 point deficits in the first quarter. And mm-hmm. it, with three minutes to play, let that be Darius's time rather than Don's time. I agree. Let's end part one there. Come back tomorrow for part two. Martin will be with us again. We're going to dive into some questions like Evan Mobley. Is the Cavs offense good enough? Which we kind of just talked about in some ways. And the schedule. Big important topics. More on the next Lockdown Cavs.